Hey, what's up, everyone? And welcome to another P-Cubed Film School. It sounds like Rose has the hiccups. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome. Uh, we're your hosts. This is Raf. That's Lauren. And we've got Troy and Rose, as per our usual crew thus far. Without further ado, I think it's time to introduce our subject for this episode. We are watching another personal favorite of mine. I suppose a favorite yes. of both of us. Hey, there we go. There's Troy. So we're watching Die Hard. It's Christmas time. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And Indeed. it's the season for Christmas films as well. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to watch a Christmas movie. And we decided mm -hmm. what better Christmas movie than one of our favorite films, Die Hard, 1988. Uh, don't mi I didn't mean to stick in the 80s like we've been doing for a large part of the <laughs> yeah, series thus far. But it's okay. It's Christmas. <laughs> I think it's turning out that the 80s actually did really define us. I didn't think we were much 80s movies buff, movie buffs. But well, a, a lot of the stuff I like comes from the 80s. Like a lot of my yeah, music I think I like it turns out. Yeah, synth I do enjoy Synthwave. So maybe, I don't know. I didn't think we were big 80s people, but now I'm learning something about myself. <laughs> so how much do we know about Die Hard here? That's the question. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm always excited to watch this movie. This is one of my comfort films that I could watch anytime. Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe only one person here has not seen it. That's me. <laughs> so Troy has seen it. <laughs> it's always you. Three or four times. Okay. Yeah. So uh, well, well, you be you teach the class then. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're let's better at doing this than me. Let's hear your informed opinions. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so Rose, though, so this will be your first time. I'm super excited to watch this with you for the first time because... This is just this is just a great movie. I don't know how else to put it. Like nobody dislikes Die Hard. It's just not a thing that <laughs> yeah, happens, yeah. you know. <laughs> so no matter what, you're in for a great time, um, and honestly, just a phenomenal story. But it's a really this movie this is the kind of movie that just leaves you with a good feeling. Uh, it's not going to be significantly less depressing than our last episode on the thing, which <laughs> yes. great film, but does not leave you with good feelings. Um, and there's a lot of argument as to whether or not this film can be categorized as a Christmas film. But to me, there's no argument because that's dumb. No, Why would you say it's not a Christmas film? Yeah. Everyone who says it's not a Christmas film is wrong. Yeah. Objectively. Oh. And, and their opinions don't matter. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to them. Don't trust them for anything else. They're probably anti-vaxxers too. <laughs> so let's talk about Die Hard. I feel like there's not a lot of preamble we have to do for this one because it's a pretty straightforward yeah. film. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's yeah, pretty you, you could jump into this film with very minimal preparation, but seeing as Rose knows absolutely nothing about film or the film industry, maybe we should talk about a few things because I think there are a couple of people that you can't, uh, that you have to talk about with Die Hard that are involved. Obviously, Alan Rickman, we'll probably talk about afterwards because um, yeah. it's a big Alan Rickman movie. But obviously, you have to talk about Bruce Willis. Yep. Obviously. Uh, of course. So let's dive right in with him before I talk about the director. Uh, so Bruce Willis is a bit of an A-lister nowadays. Actually, maybe not now, uh, nowadays. Not I, now, now. I was talking about how... He's, I'm, he's considered an A-lister nowadays in the past. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Because I was talking about how I was getting kind of depressed prepping for this episode and thinking like, man... What happened to Bruce Willis? Like, you see what yeah. he's doing nowadays. I kid you not. I keep up with trailers on a fairly regular basis just in order to keep touch with the industry and, you know, develop a catalog of stuff that I'm looking forward to. But whew, it feels like every other week I'm seeing a new trailer for a Bruce Willis movie and they're all garbage, like steaming hot garbage. He has gone to the mm. bargain bin direct to DVD nonsense Yep. that he's just do it, turning these out and doing film after film and just making money and clearly it's has awful, no man. passion and is giving nothing to it. it they look they look like awful films um and yeah, the worst, movies are, are released on the clearance uh aisle and the worst part is they all kind of look the same too is like they're a lot of this exact same looking movie and it's just Ooh, what's he doing to his career and his legacy? But I'll tell you what, Bruce Willis used to be great. <laughs> I could say Bruce used Willis was actor. Bruce Willis used was awesome, is what uh, I'm reminded of prepping for this episode. Bruce Willis was awesome once upon a time. So for a little bit of background, Bruce Willis, he was a pretty low profile actor at the time of this film. When I was growing up, 
Bruce Willis was no doubt an A-lister, right? He was a household name. I knew who Bruce Willis was before I knew what Die Hard was. To yeah. like that yeah. was that was just the extent of his fame. Uh, so at the time of this film, though, 1988, he was a fairly low-profile actor. He was not at all an A-lister. Uh, he came from a working-class family, and he got into acting at kind of a young age and decided to pursue it. So he did off-Broadway for a while, you know, did a, a fair amount of theater, and then kind of lucked his way into some film and TV gigs, mostly uncredited at the outset, uh, just little extras roles and things like that. He did mm -hmm. appear in one episode of Miami Vice, as well as one episode of The Twilight Zone, fun fact. So those were some of his earliest credits, right? He did a lot of uncredited work, but those were kind of some of his earliest credits. So, you know, he might have been a little recognizable, but then came... A bit of a landing point where he landed the leading role in a TV comedy called Moonlighting, where he starred opposite Sybil Shepherd, and that started in 1985. So that was kind of a launching pad for Bruce Willis at the start, because this kind of it was a lead role in a recurring comedy series. It ran for a number of years. It was actually still running when they shot Die Hard. And this kind of showcased his charisma and, you know, basically is considered by a lot of people to be a bit of a staging platform for getting him in, in the door for Die Hard. Because, yeah, comedy is a good format, right, to show off somebody's, mm -hmm. somebody's range. And to be fair, he's like charisma is what he brings, right? Like he has a bit of a he has a bit of a presence that is kind of casual and fun and funny and that was kind of you yeah. hear the stories of how he got some of his earliest rules and how he l lucked into film and tv was basically stuff like that like he was doing regular working jobs in new york trying to pay the bills you know he was like a bartender and stuff and people would just come across and be like man you got a really captivating personality uh and so yeah moonlighting was a big showcase for that for his his screen charisma and so with that, now all of a sudden he's a recognizable name, now all of a sudden he's employable, and that leads us to his starring role as John McClane in Die Hard, 1988, which undoubtedly was his big break. I don't think anybody would argue that. Mm -hmm. Like, he was a nobody, and then know. Die Hard happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and that pretty much launched his career as a leading man and as an action star like he is probably one of the definitive action stars of the 80s yeah. uh besides i guess there was a handful of definitive action stars in the 80s yeah. the 80s was full of action stars making their career right you get van damme in this era you get all the great stallone films you get although stallone kind of started in the 70s what was that schwarzenegger yeah schwarzenegger was big in this era uh all those guys um so, but Bruce Willis but was a part a, of that wave. And you brought a different kind of action hero to the, to the screen, too. Yeah, and that's right. With guys like, I mean, I think guys like Stallone are definitely heavy on the charisma side as well. But Stallone was yeah, also, yeah. you know, he's an also <laughs> yeah, he's also an incredible athlete, super ripped. Uh, and he could handle himself well in, like, actually performing action and boxing and martial arts, all that. But that kind of wasn't, that wasn't necessarily... Bruce Willis's shtick, as you'll quickly see in this movie. So we'll we'll let the movie show you what kind of action hero he is, but this is definitely an archetype of action hero that's basically being invented in this film, which is going to be pretty... Archetypes. Yeah, yeah, which is going to be pretty awesome to watch. You've definitely seen more characters like this since this film, but this is the progenitor. Uh, so, yeah, he's since gone on to star in countless iconic films, not just action films, but all sorts of films. Um, and he's just been a leading man and has reprised the role of John McClane for the entire franchise. Die Hard has become mm -hmm. the sprawling franchise now that has had, I think, like five films, I want to say. Uh, I still I haven't think... seen the latest one, but apparently you don't need to. Uh, yeah. So that's Bruce Willis. Good guy. So then there's John McTiernan, who is the director of this film. And I'll talk about him for a second because he whew, he made a large part of a lot of people's childhoods, <laughs> even though it's weird because he never really became much of a household name, probably because his career was kind of short lived. I was looking at IMDb earlier and he only directed like a handful of films. I think he has 12 yeah. directing credits, something crazy like that. 12. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm 12. Right okay, yeah, you got it there. But yeah. he directed some iconic action movies from the 80s and 90s. He did yeah. Predator. He did Die Hard. He did The Hunt for Red October. He did Last Action yep. Hero. And then he went on to do, I think, the third Die Hard movie, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yep. Which is very interesting because the, he only directed two Die Hard films. I say only, but that's more than one film in a franchise. So <laughs> uh, he directed two Die Hard films which are probably my favorite and least favorite Die Hard films. I know people are going to give me <laughs> flack for that because a lot of people really love Die Hard with a Vengeance. I kind of bounced off of that movie. I think it's the weakest in the series. Um, but to each their own. But you got to admit the chemistry between Bruce Willis and Samuel L. Jackson is really good. Yeah. And that kind of carries the film. Can't be bad. But beyond that, I thought it was the very mediocre uh, entry in the Die Hard canon but nonetheless that's john mctiernan he really defined a lot of a lot of people's childhood including my own um die hard is definitely a big one for me that's probably the biggest on that list but obviously predator is huge for a number of people that's probably one we'll eventually watch on pq film school although i don't know predator's status as high art is a bit is a bit shaky but it's just so vital like in like the canon of action movies like, i feel like if there's if we are gonna watch predator we'd have to watch like a handful of other movies and just talk about them all as like a package a package deal of influencing the yeah. action of a generation and then to be fair like predator is a great movie don't get me wrong it's it's a great yeah. action film it's full of all sorts of good stuff there's a reason it's classic it's really really good but it's also, yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is, right? It doesn't pretend to be anything more than it is. And I think yeah. that's part of what makes a great action film as well. Although I say that as we're about to watch Die Hard, which I think has actually a lot of artistic merit and is a genuinely well-told story. But is it true? nonetheless, we probably will still watch Predator on PQ Film mm -hmm. School just, just for completion's sake. So that being said, those are some of the key players uh, you'll see. A lot more actors that we haven't talked about yet in this film. Uh, and like I said, Alan Rickman is definitely one we're going to have to talk about after the fact. But I think that's all we really need going into it is you need to know this was Bruce Willis's big break, who Rose, you only know purely intellectually to now be a very famous actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was directed by a very venerable action film director although i suppose he was still developing that reputation at the time predator was just before this this was the last film that was the last film he did and then from there he jumped straight to die hard and quite frankly if you ask me die hard is his masterpiece that's yeah epic tier john mctiernan action awesomeness it really doesn't get better than die hard it really doesn't well and that's the thing i, I suppose we should note is that there are very few definitive best in genres that are popularly yeah. considered. And Die Hard is beyond any doubt the best of its genre. And there's just as far as consensus goes, right? There's just so many people that would agree on that. And I would agree on that. And I'm yeah. an action connoisseur that has watched all sorts of action films. But yeah, it's really hard to say that any film but Die Hard belongs at the top of that category. It's just such, such a perfect film. And, and the thing is, like, all the films that even get close are all Die Hard um, inspired. That's true. Yeah, there are a lot of films that get really close, <laughs> yeah, but like, that wouldn't really be possible without Die Hard. And therefore, yeah. by sheer progeny, you know, it has to it has to come first, just because it invented a bit of an action movie formula, and so. Just strap yourself in, Rose, for seeing this for the first time. You're about to have some of the most intense, well, one of the most intense two hours of your life. It's a... Uh, I'm ready. Yeah, it's a crazy <laughs> thrill ride. It's full of great story, great action, and it's just such a well-written, well-performed movie. Everything about it is masterclass. Extremely so, well-performed. Yeah, very well-performed. Uh, uh, We'll talk about that later yeah i'll talk i'll talk a bit more about that later <laughs> on there's definitely a lot to unpack when we get to the other side of this movie so really that's all the intro you need for die hard get into it. great action movie let's get into this see you after the film all right and we're back right after watching hey. die hard how are we doing i love that movie <laughs> i know how are we doing on a rewatch for those of us who have seen it already 
It's always such a good movie. It, it's always such a fun movie to watch. It is. Yeah. It's such a fun movie. Like, again, that's what is one of my comfort movies that you could just watch anytime. It's so good. But it's especially good around Christmas time. Because oh, I think I've watched this movie on a, on a lot of Christmases. I don't know about every Christmas, but I've definitely watched it on a number of Christmases. Lot, yeah. yeah. But yeah, always love this movie. And it always shocks me how much I still love the movie. You know what I mean? It feels like it would get old after a while, but Die Hard never really gets nope. old. Like you watch <laughs> it and you notice so many new details and because there's it's just so dense. There's so much going on narratively and so many little tiny details that for you to pick up on. Like I was telling Lauren, one of the things uh, that was just in there that I never noticed before for some reason was in that scene when the uh, officer Powell uh, is backing up out of the parking lot when he's oh, as he's getting shot at when he first discovers yeah. that there's actually something happening and you could see like in the background it cuts to that shot inside the limo when the limo driver is just completely clue clueless that anything's going on he's just jamming and vibing you see the police car go out in the background and you can see the body on the hood just flop off of it as he's flying by and it's just such a hilarious shot because the freaking <laughs> ragdoll corpse just flying through yeah. the air i did completely never noticed that you could see the body fly off of the hood in that shot until this time around but yeah we do have a uh, first timer so rose first impressions go that was cool i had no idea what i was coming into <laughs> yeah so you were you were well i guess we say this every time but shockingly fresh to this Shockingly. film you just had the most fresh had no i've clue. ever been to any of the movies really you would sure, say the most know. fresh yeah yeah more fresh than alien anything going into this one more fresh than alien because at least i knew about the aliens that's true you you know that they're aliens <laughs> you know i know what they look like that's true yeah i imagine you've seen the xenomorph design before that but but, but like die hard i knew nothing about all right absolutely Just, that was a christmas, movie. <laughs> <laughs> christmas action movie that's all you're going in with besides the RL or preamble I don't even know it was an action movie. Well, we talked about how it was a great action movie beforehand, as in, you know, during the our whole opening spiel. That's true. Before that, I didn't know it was an action movie. <laughs> so, yeah, you have officially been introduced to the charismatic action hero that is John McClane, played by Bruce Willis. <laughs> and yep. that must be an experience, because everybody falling in love with this character is always something. <laughs> Because <laughs> he's just he's such a great action hero, isn't he? He's literally just the action hero that you just love to love because yeah. he's constantly saying stuff that the audience is thinking and behaving in such a natural way. Well, because obviously there's a lot of improv in this film, um, yeah. especially with the nature of films like this, like the script was flip flopping a lot of the time. But there's just so much banter that Bruce Willis is just rattling off. And it gives this the character such a naturalistic vibe because he's behaving so humanly the whole time. Yeah. Because he's just saying stuff, just like saying random stuff and just swearing the whole time. And like there's a certain level of believability to this, you know, New York cop running around this building in a bad situation, just screaming F-bombs every like the whole time he's falling down a flight of stairs, you know? <laughs> Yeah, like that, like the fight with Carl at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carl. He's just like he's, 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 he's just having a headlock, and he just punches him. I just saying random things. He's just like, I'm gonna cook you. I'm gonna eat you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like his tra his trash talk is so great. It's, yeah, it's like it's like it, it's it's you can't script for that because that's just him going. Yeah, that's just raw Bruce Willis charisma. Yeah. Well, and now Rose, because Rose, you went through, you were one of our players on our tabletop role-playing campaign, Resident Roleplay. So yeah. we've, we've talked at length with Joe about like uh, the a lot of the action hero reference what? for Chauncey. Big Chauncey vibes. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, you could definitely, you could <laughs> probably see a lot of where Chauncey came from now, because obviously Joe really loves John McClane as well. He's obviously, he's a, Chauncey's like a mixed bag of, kind of all the action 80s action heroes put together right because mm -hmm. like he's 
he fights like Rambo, but he has like the personality of John McClane big time. And the way he's just smack talking yeah. the whole time while he's kicking butt. Yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, this film was a uh, resounding success when it first arrived in 1988. Um, it was a mega success, some would say, at the box office. Uh, it was nominated for four Oscars as well. Obviously, it propelled Bruce Willis's career and kind of remains his most iconic role to date. I think we could solidly yeah. say that, right? Like when people think Bruce Still Willis... some of his best acting. Yeah, I, I, honestly, easily some of his best acting. And... Uh, in 2017, this film was actually selected for preservation in the National Film Registry by the Library Ooh. of Congress. So this film... What does that mean? That means that this means film... It's never going to die. It's never going to go away. This film is never going to uh, go it, away. It has been archived for all of eternity, or at least until uh, the U.S. government shuts down. Yeah, it's, yeah. As long as archived. the American government exists. At this rate, that's yeah. probably next year. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, though? Because it's possible. I mean, maybe it's, history would say is, otherwise. Like, we yeah. lost the Library of Alexandria. But yeah. it, it is possible it, it for been... the the that library to survive the country, in theory. Just yeah. because oh, if absolutely. somebody cares enough about it, right? It, most of those, those things also have been, like, digitally preserved as well, as long as, as, as well as, like, the original copies. Like, I'm sure, like, the actual film stock is preserved there, as well as digital reproductions, as well as you know various different mediums that these kinds of things come on just because they future proof that stuff mm -hmm. uh, uh yeah that's all that purpose of preservation largest archive i think currently on the planet i'm not sure it might be one of the largest archives yeah the one library of the, the library of congress of, yeah yeah runs and i know there's a lot of different archival projects that they like help fund mm -hmm. which is really admirable because film uh, preservation and archiving is kind of a subject that I'm really passionate about. But just as like, you know, my kind of archivist nature, I just really mm -hmm. love the idea of preserving things for future generations. And, and like big cultural touchstones like that, that get introduced into the archives. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. They select films that they deem, uh, I believe the terms they use is uh, culturally, uh, aesthetically, or historically significant. Yeah. Um, and usually pretty much all the films they select are some combination of the three. And this definitely matches, you know, that description. It is definitely sure. aesthetically hugely significant, right? Like the imagery of this film is so iconic, but also, yeah, culturally, the way it shaped action movies to come, right? We talked about how the John McClane archetype of action hero is just an archetype yep. now that you see the everyday times. action man. Yeah. The everyday action man. Right. It inspired, inspired one big character, you know, in one of our works of Chauncey yep. and it's, uh, and, uh, as well as the whole structure of the film and the way we talked about in our preamble, how there have been a lot of action movies since that have essentially taken the same type of either, uh, approach to the setting or the structure itself it's just it's really influential in that regard yeah we talked about bruce willis early on but we didn't talk about alan rickman because that's best left to after you see the film you gotta see it first yeah because yeah. bruce willis as john mcclain absolutely iconic but i would argue alan rickman as hans gruber equally so and just such a perfect villain to be opposite this character they, and they they are such a good pair. And the thing that makes this film, I think what really makes this film still so solid after so many rewatches is the chemistry between the whole cast, but especially the chemistry between John McClane and Hans Gruber, right? You, those yeah. are your two totems on either side of the spectrum. And seeing them go head to head for an entire feature length film is just like, you love them both. Yeah. And it's like, like, you almost want to see both of them succeed, but you can't because <laughs> it's yeah. just not and feasible. They, They're so opposed. And they never, they never meet until like halfway through yeah. the, the movie. But they, but their chemistry, like they, that they're talking and like you see mm. them both in their own respective environments and they're just bouncing off of each other. How, you know, John McClane's affecting uh, Gruber, how Gruber's affecting John McClane. And yeah. they're just like, constantly going back and forth and at war and then when they finally meet there's that moment of just like it's happening and, and they don't know <laughs> yeah and they don't know <laughs> but clever john mcclain he tests him mm -hmm. but that's uh, i mean clever john mcclain and clever hans gruber that's what makes it so yeah. good is they yeah. both handle their si the situation so perfectly right as, they as, immediately as, as, as neither of them could have yeah exactly they handle the situation as well as they both could have it's like 
immediately goes into deception mode immediately and then john mcclain immediately tests him to see if he's trustworthy yep. and that's what makes it so good the writing is so airtight because all of the characters are constantly active and constantly thinking you know except for that darn limo driver <laughs> yeah well but he still has an action to do you know he's partying yeah. <laughs> he's <laughs> Like, I didn't realize that it wasn't until, like, he doesn't even realize anything is happening. Like, he's until in he's his on own TV. world. And yeah, until basically, like, like, everybody else, like, finds out at the same time he does. And he's in the building. <laughs> yeah. He do- I love that he doesn't even realize he can't leave until he, yeah. he sees it on TV. He's like, oh, there are police there's outside. A, like, oh, the, and the building has been shut down. Really? <laughs> and I love, and I love, I love how he drives off with, uh, Jonah and Holly. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's what I love Loyal about this structure driver. of film. That's what I love about this structure of film is like if, if you look at it from a plot, uh, just a boiled, boiled, boiled down plot uh, uh, beats. It's just like John McClane arrives, something happens, his marriage is tested, and then he leaves. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, but like the thing that that's that part where his marriage is tested. Is the whole film, which is, you know, all the action segments where the Nakatomi Plaza is, like, you know, getting raided. Mm. But basically, that's, the, that's like, the, the beats of the, the movie is he arrives, some stuff happens, and then he leaves. That's the beginning, and, middle, and end. <laughs> yep. And it's, it's picture perfect. He arrives in a limo, he leaves in a limo, he's got his wife, and it's like, oh, yeah, now everything's fixed. Mm-hmm. Now it's time for Christmas. Now it's time for Christmas. Well, uh, let me... So, say really quick about alan rickman now obviously he's a much more well-known actor now um but this was actually i only recently discovered his first film role really yeah this was the first time somebody put alan rickman to film really yeah i didn't know that yeah i would assume that he's just been acting for forever (laughs) no i mean he has been acting for forever yeah um but it was all theater and television beforehand obviously a Um, lot of theater you know he's he's british lots of theater um but yeah the i think it was might have been john mctiernan or the casting director uh, literally discovered him at a theater performance you know when they saw i don't know what production they were looking at but apparently he was playing uh the villain in it and they saw that and they're just like that's hans gruber (laughs) <laughs> yeah i want that in my movie i want that in my movie but and he's so he's so perfect he's so perfect he is hans gruber nobody else could have done that and still yeah. probably my favorite role of it. eat your heart out still one harry of my potter villains. fans <laughs> still one of my favorite villains for sure honestly like, yeah hans gruber is hands down one of my favorite uh definitely f- favorite film villains of all time yeah without well, a doubt yeah that's true, that's true. Because, but, but just the way he's portrayed, he's you know he's cold. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's calculated, he's charismatic, and calculating, and and he just knows. He knows what he's about. Yeah, unapologetically. And yeah, and he's just got such a commanding presence that you get kind of absorbed by. You know the way he handles the situation. Well, me and uh, Raf just like we're just geeking out again when it happens. Like his introduction, the doors yes. of the of the vehicle fly, fly, fly open, and then this you know entourage of like armed <laughs> big dudes come out, and then there's just Hans Gruber, calm, stoic, just going like time to do business. Mm-hmm. And then he comes out, he's got his little book, he's reading his notes, and then speech time. Yep. And it's just it's like oh, this guy's gonna murder a lot of people in cold blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clockwork. Yeah, that first shot of hans gruber is such an epic shot the way he just rolls out of the truck with the squad just yeah. walking surrounded by these big friggin' dudes oh it's cinematic so perfection that first shot of hans gruber just chef's kiss yeah i i i think it's pretty hilarious how at first he seems to be a pretty ambitious guy and a pretty Got a like, notorious criminal yeah, <laughs> yeah. when like at the end, it turns out he's nothing more than a glorified burglar. Yeah, he just—it's it's a bank heist, basically. Yeah, but <laughs> just, the most ex- like the, the most expensive and the most over-the-top bank heist. <laughs> yeah, the most elaborate bank heist for yeah. sure. <laughs> also, there's a freaking ambulance in the truck. Yeah. Oh yeah, the ambulance rolling out yeah. of the truck. <laughs> the just like, what the heck's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all thought that was gonna work? <laughs> But uh, that's the that, thing. That, that's the... 
okay, it shows it. the foresight, right? Because mm-hmm. it shows like they, they like they don't bring any attention to because it, it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't work. But you can see the clockwork. You can see the thought process that Hans Gruber set in like you know the planning stage as everything's happening. He doesn't have to explain what's going on. You see, it's like, oh yeah, I get that uh, that that trope, right? Like rolling out with the good guys and the, and the bad guys escape. He doesn't have, they don't have to say anything. It's just like that that truck comes out. It's like, oh, that's their escape vehicle. It's you know they're gonna they're gonna try to get out with the squad of ambulances that are gonna that are gonna come after. Even though it never works, mm. you can see that he planned everything out from the beginning to the end. Yeah, and I was gonna say that's what part of what makes such a good villain for me you know, seeing Hans Gruber is that, not just that he's so charismatic, right? He's got the charisma to rival yeah. John McClane the whole film and the cleverness, yeah, but yeah, the, and I think that's what makes it such perfect writing too, is the fact that their plan works, you know what I mean? Yeah. On every level. It's an airtight plan and yeah. barring any interference, they would have gotten away with it scot-free. Literally, even, they, even with interference, it basically still worked. That's true. Yeah, but even with interference, they made it ninety nine percent of the way there. Yeah. Like so, the cops are coming in. I love that line where it's like, "Don't like, like just calm down." This is purely a matter of inconvenient timing. Exactly. It's like, yeah, and then and there's that line like, "You don't realize what he means yet," but upon you know subsequent watches, uh, when that line that he says, "Police in it, like uh, police intervention was inevitable." And actually kind of necessary. Yeah, because it's part of their plan. It's part of their plan, plan like, yeah, at like, least arrive. Yeah, like there's, uh, you know, John called the cops and it's like, well, that was like an hour early, but whatever. We can work with this. Yeah. And that's it's at that moment you realize just how much control of the situation yeah. they're in. Because obviously they say that to the hostages plenty. But it's at that moment that the audience realizes how much control they're in. Because mm-hmm. they've planned out every single detail and the only thing they didn't account for was the one person who wasn't supposed to be there. Who wasn't supposed to be there. Just flying the ointment. Mm-hmm. Flying the ointment, yeah. yeah. yeah but it's, it's so good. Such perfect plotting. Oh, yeah. That whole bit with the FBI turning the, the power off being necessary yeah. to their plan was just a master stroke. Oh, yeah. And then that freaking... I forget, I forget what the classical... Uh, composition that is that they use for this, but it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Ota Joy, yeah, is like the Christmasified version of it, but um, with the doors opening, it's such a majestic Merry moment. Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, epic. It's, yeah, it's like you, you wanted a miracle, I give you the FBI. <laughs> also, shout outs to that city engineer who's just like, I, I could, I could, I got it right here. We can't, it's, we can't do it, it's impossible. Actually, I'm the guy. I, I can do it. I got it right here. I'm in the hole. I love that no, guy. Nobody ever asked the guy in the hole. I can do it. Workers. Yeah, they know what they're doing. Yeah, the worker and the supervisor. Yeah, but that's what I it love. Can't be about- done. I can do it. it can't be no. done. I can do it. But that's what I love about this film as well, right? There are so many, so All many details, de- so yeah. much attention the to details. Building, right? Yeah, just even though it's like our world. Yeah, you don't. You, that stuff has to be written in. <laughs> exactly, because there's so many little interactions like that that you could just miss, right? You could easily overlook that entire story, like that little mini storyline that takes place in that scene, right? Yeah, and it's so easy to just not even think about it, but it's just little details like that that are written into every scene. There's there's practically a story arc in every single scene. It's it's brilliant writing, to be frank. This is mm-hmm. a film that has really inspired me as a writer, because... I love the whole... Oh, you good? I was just going to say, it's just, you know, two plus good. hours of just, yeah, air tightness. But yeah, what were you saying? Yeah. I love the whole, like, reporter story arc. Yeah, his whole yeah. subplot is just... At first, you're just kind of <laughs> like, up. yeah, where's this going? You know? And then yeah. you see him show up with yeah, the camera crew, and you're just like, okay, I get it. This is just going to be, like, another camera angle. Yeah. But then it's he ends up being the deciding factor of how the ending goes, right? Yep. Where he gives gives her away. Yep. And uh, it's like, oh, wow, what a jerk. Yeah, it's just such an interesting and little... Them at the end. Yeah, she gets, she gets she, a punch. She gets him back. She, she gets him back. Gets him back. It's such a weird little subplot, though, that you're not even sure where it's going. But then everything, but every single off. thread somehow weaves together in the end to pay off. 
They planted that limo driver just to knock out one of the bad guys who was unaccounted for yeah. <laughs> way back in act one. And then he yep. gets the bunch of, and then he gets to drive them off too. So yeah. it's a double payoff. But yeah, so many little stuff like that. There is hardly not, a wasted not a line, line of dialogue. Yeah. Or, a, or a wasted, like, almost like a, a piece of, like, prop. That, yeah. Uh, if, if they touched it, it was useful. Like, something happened several scenes, several acts later. Oh, like, yeah. Everything that, that, that was in the film that was uh, mentioned, touched, brought up, had a place. Mm -hmm. uh, like I was saying, like yeah, like the the story or the um, picture frame, the, like like they have that argument. She turns the picture frame over. It's like that comes up later. Yeah, when the, the first thing you he see never that. sees. Like, yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, jump the watch. Like it's a Rolex. We never see the watch except at the very end when it's when, relevant. When it becomes when relevant to the story. Relevant. Yeah. Gun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Chekhov's Rolex. <laughs> just it's cost. It was full of just setups and payoffs constantly one after the other after, and you never you can never tell how it's going to pay off but it does mm -hmm. and that's the thing is i think rose was saying for the whole first act she was kind of in the weeds you know you said you're a little confused right of like what yeah. the movie yeah. was actually going to be about because it's hard to tell when you're just starting out if you assuming you know absolutely nothing about this film that is yeah. but like, that's the thing. It just feels if it, it, I could see how it could feel kind of weird coming into it. It's just in seeing all this normal stuff. It was like, this is an action movie, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's very mundane in its opening. It just but, looks like a Christmas movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It opens basically. Yeah. Just like any other Christmas movie. It's just like, ah, oh, I'm in California from New York for the season. Uh, my marriage is on the rocks. A, Christmas party. <laughs> a, a big uppity Christmas party full of corporate types. And yeah. Suits. A bunch of cor rich corporate suits. Yeah, but, doing cocaine on my wife's desk. <laughs> sounds like the beginning of a Hallmark movie. Yeah, it, it very much does. Yeah. But it's just, but it, it, but wait, it, you've got that little edge of just like of something that little edge of grime, right? Like he, like uh, he's getting off the plane and he's got a gun, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, what's that? Why, okay, why did we see cop. his gun? Why is that important? It's like, oh, it's a cop. Oh, right, right. So we're just establishing his character. He's never going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. You can completely miss. All of the setup that's being done in that first act. The first act is doing some heavy lifting. I realized this time around because there are so many little details that are being set up there that are completely necessary. Like you said, um, the picture frame, right? She slams it down and it stays down and she clocks that when she goes into her office again to speak with Hans Gruber the first time, right? She's like, good. The picture frame's still down. Yeah. He doesn't know. It says Gennaro or whatever her name was, yeah, uh, Gennaro yeah. on her door, yeah. right? <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> little details like that, yeah, the Rolex. All these she little corrects him when, like, when he addresses her by her title, she's like, Miss Gennaro. Yeah, she Miss corrects him Gennaro. to, yeah, because like that's, you know. Uh, Making double sure. Double sure. Yeah, and the, well, the whole setup with her name to begin with as well, right? Yeah. You, he walks into the lobby, you see that. It's just like, oh, I can't find my wife's name under McLean. What's that about? Yeah. Sir looks up her maiden name. Nah. Well, there it is. And then that becomes the subject of their argument. And then that becomes the reason why the villain can't identify uh, any leverage against John McClane for the whole film yeah. until the very end when a reporter that they plant in Act Two comes out, <laughs> goes to their home, threatens the it, nanny. And it's like, here's their kids. <laughs> here's, yeah. It's. Oh. The writing man yeah that's yeah a master class in setup and payoff execution it's really good stuff and the whole film mm -hmm. is laden with this type of stuff it's so dense and the more times i watch this film the more times i'm impressed by the sheer number of setup and payoffs that they manage to execute it's it's impressive impressive yeah. storytelling for sure very dense mm-hmm absolutely rewards several viewings oh yeah absolutely you have to watch this movie multiple times to gain at least almost uh, any appreciation year. yeah at least and once a, a month year month. <laughs> but that's the thing too is it's solidly superficially entertaining on a first watch yeah. through for that same reason right it's fun. it's fun and it's clever and although a lot of those payoffs still work just on a first play, uh, watch there, yeah. right? You watch it and you're just like, oh, I forgot about that, you know? <laughs> and then it comes back. 
and that's the that's what uh, Shane Black talks about this a lot too. Also, a big action movie screenwriter from the same era. He talks about setups and payoffs in those same kind of terms. He says the he once said that the, the thing, the effect that a setup and payoff should have on an audience members is to make them go, ah, I forgot about that, or you know, why didn't I yeah. think of that? You know, it's that's. And this film pulls it off in spades. Mm -hmm. It's a hat trick that they just keep on pulling. And it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing. So another thing about the writing while we're on that subject is this film is often pointed to as a solid example. And I think it's probably one of the quintessential examples of three act structure. I'm going to talk about writing for a bit <laughs> since this is my area mm -hmm. of expertise. And uh, this is PQ Film School. So this is where we could teach this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, film structure. There are a lot of different ways to structure, well, any story, right? So, if you, well, if you look to mythology, you could see a kind of structure in the tales and a lot of the oral epics and other sort of things that were recorded from ancient myth. And a lot of people have gone back and mapped out those structures. Obviously, um, John Campbell, I think, uh, yeah. wrote the... Heroes Myth. Yeah, the, uh, or the... Hero's Journey. Um, Here's Jeremy. Here's Jeremy. Well, he, the Hero of a Thousand Faces, I think, was the name of the book where he codifies it. Very controversial right, yeah. book among writers. Um, but it is that's where he codifies the hero's journey. Yeah. Which is a common mythology structure. I think it's something like, well, the, I think the number of acts varies depending on different interpretations of yeah, it. I don't I have no idea what the original book says, how many acts. Yeah, I think are, the original like, book says like 10 acts or something crazy like I that. Think, I think it's something like 12. It's uh, there's yeah, a lot. But it's like it's more. Weird. The more people think about it, it's like uh, it changes with whoever talks about it because yeah. there's a lot. And basically, there's only really a, a key number of things that actually really matter mm -hmm. that uh, people have latched onto. Yeah, but basically, the hero's journey maps out a number of beats that was common to mythology of how uh, they would progress their stories in order to achieve a given effect, you know, where it, it gets given to the audience. And that's the thing. Structure... So I'm just giving that as a basic intro to structure, right? So that's what structure is. Structure is the way a story is constructed, the way it flows, what events happen, in what order, and when. And structure, for the most part, is invisible. And that's what I think is kind of cool about it, is structure is something that works on the subconscious level of the audience. Because... A story can be very long, right? A lot of these ancient mythological epics were designed to be experienced over the course of like days and weeks, right? You would go hear the bard recount the tale from memory, you know, for a few hours a day, and it'll be like, wow, that was amazing. You know, you come back and next come back tomorrow. And yeah, come back tomorrow, it. next week, whatever it may be, yeah, and hear the rest of it. And they'll just keep going until they finish the tale and then they'll start again, right? So, in that sense, structure is by its nature, very invisible because there's a structure that the bard probably actually has a pretty educated understanding of, but there is a structure to it that you're not really seeing in the moment. In the moment you're hearing dialogue, yeah. you're hearing sentences, you're hearing all these things as you're having this myth recounted to you, mm -hmm. but you're not really seeing the big picture and that's what structure is. But the yeah, big so picture- You have to step back from so you can see everything in relation to each other to see how the structure creates drama and payoffs mm -hmm. and that's the thing is yeah it is inherently big picture and it doesn't it doesn't really affect you in the moment but, or but it affects you on a subconscious level right like if the structure is long for example if the story is long that will affect the way you view the story if you've been sitting through it in chronological order that's kind of how epics work on you right by the time you're done watching lord of the rings it's an inherently different experience than it would be if those movies were like several hours shorter, you know? Yeah. If they were like standard length movies, it wouldn't have the same effect by the time you get to that ending as it does by the fact that they made them deluxe size, you know? So that's some of the things that time does to a story, right? Just adding length or, and that's some of the ways that structure affects it as well. The way the story is structured affects the feeling you get by the time you come to its ending. And it's really only something that could be understood retroactively, right? You don't yeah. feel, I mean, you feel the changing of the pace and the way you flow from one thing to yeah. the next while you're in the moment, but it's not until you really get to the end of the story that you could look back and kind of see some yeah. semblance of the journey. Because the journey, you yeah. look back 
and then you see where you started and then where you ended and then you kind of see the path that you had to take to get to where you you, you ended up at the end of the story mm -hmm. but while you're going through that journey you can't see all the turns and all the twists and turns that you're about to take but you look back on it then you can see the structure of it you can see the journey that you had to take to get to where you are from where you started yeah and so the hero's journey, the monomyth, as it's often called, that's one example of structure, and that's a very that's a very popular one for a lot of reasons. Um, it's very heady. It's, it's very it, kind of esoteric. <laughs> yeah, it is. But what you see, and obviously, and then as the years go by, you get into theater, and theater has very specific kinds of structures that have been found to work well for it. Um, and you get to like you know England, and you get Shakespeare, and then now all of a sudden you have like establishment of standards like uh, five act structure. Um, and I'm sure that was established well long before, but he definitely popularized it uh, in his tragedies. But from theater, you get the concept of acts, right? Because theater is live performance. Live performers need breaks. You've got, and plus, you know, there's different setup that you might need for different uh, stages, Tradition, different then. scenes. Yeah. yeah. And so then the whole thing gets divided into acts. Uh, so that you can have little breaks for the performers, as well as time to set up new material for your staging. So, and also little breaks for the audiences as well, I'm sure are in there. So, the concept of acts kind of originates in theater, but then when we transition to film, because theater was kind of the closest previous equivalent, then the tr concept of acts begins transferring there, and writers generally understand uh, film in acts. So in film, however, film is a very different medium because in stage, granted, they are generally comparable length stories, but generally speaking, stage tends to go a little longer, right? You have a huge investment. You're watching live performance. There's a lot to it. It pays to have kind of longer ish, uh, theater performances. However, in film, generally speaking, films are a lot shorter. Right. They could range from maybe like 90 minutes on the shorter end to, you know, the films like this, 120, 130 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then super long films are like 180 minutes ish. Yep. You or know, four hours if you're Lord of the Rings. Yeah. If you're the extended guts, <laughs> at least. <laughs> so. But that's that's what's considered long for a film. And technically, that's not very much space to tell a story. In fact, if you look at the uh, screenplays, screenplays are uh, formatted in a certain way so that uh, essentially one page of screenplay will equal one minute of screen time. Approximately. So, approximately. And so for a 120 page, a 120 minute film, that's only a, about 120 pages of writing. And that's 120 pages of a format that doesn't fill it super yeah. densely. It's, it's very small. <laughs> yeah, so you compare that to like a novel, and there's not a whole lot of story material that's really in a film. And so how do you tell a story? How do you tell an effective story in that with that little space? And then you get into short film, and it's even worse. So that is where structure comes in. Um, a lot of people have said, and I would also strongly argue, that structure is the most important aspect of writing for film. Because when you're yeah. dealing with a story of that length, structure is what's going to make it hit, and that's what's going to make it mm -hmm. memorable, and what's what's going to make yeah. it work or not. Yeah, and so especially because like when you're dealing with timescales of that short, the timing is very important because mm -hmm. the how you divide that time up um, because of the because of the structure or because the length of time is very small the ratios of time that you start to divide that time up starts to become really swingy. Like if you have a very long first act, you don't have a lot of time left over for the last stuff. Exactly. And audiences notice that stuff because the story is happening so quickly. And so structure all of a sudden, it's still mostly working on a subconscious level, but it becomes a lot more obvious because yeah. the, the you're you experiencing start, the entire yeah. thing in a much shorter span of time. You know, you're not going week by week like you would with an ancient epic. Yeah, now all of a sudden, structure becomes super important. And in Hollywood, they kind of, especially by this point in film, it was a bit more haphazard, you know, in the early days. Uh, but then you, know, you start getting into the Hollywood era and you start getting into film as we know it today, when that starts developing in like the uh, golden age of Hollywood, essentially. 
then you start to see standardizations to the stuff and you start to see the rise of the three act structure in film and the three act structure has been found to be a very effective structure for telling stories on film and it's still used very often today it is hugely standard in the film world because it works you know i've used it you know for my screenplays oh lauren dropped hopefully you'll be back soon that's the thing it's just hugely effective so this die hard is considered a really strong prototype of three act structure and three act structure particularly works well with action movies i think um because well to be fair there's a lot you don't of need too much. Yeah, you don't need too much. You need, you know, oftentimes you yeah. only need the barest minimum bones of a story. Uh, yeah. But with with Die Hard, it's super well executed because, again, it's brilliantly written, densely written. There's so much attention to detail, so many setups and payoffs that are constantly going on. And then you add on that top of that, though, the overarching structure and the way it has, as Rose was pointing out, right, this kind of patiently paced first act. Oh, so let's, well, let's establish the three act structure more clearly yeah. uh, so say, that we can there, communicate. Are there defined terms for the names of each uh, structure uh, act like if, like there is in like uh, the monomyth for a three act? Um, yeah, there are. Well, you know, they're a bit less agreed upon. However, there are general terms that are used to describe each act. Mm -hmm. So basically, if you break up a film into... Yeah, say a standard film is 120 minutes, right? You could easily divide that into quarters of 30 minutes each, essentially. Yeah, you know, just like a clock, 12 hours, 120 minutes. So if you break it into 30 minute chunks, essentially act one is considered to be the first 30 minutes of the film. Act two is a bit longer. That's 90 minutes. And then act three is the final 30 minutes. So the first act is set up, essentially. And that's where you get your rising action and stuff like that, if you think in kind of literary terms. So act one is set up, right? You establish the world, you introduce the characters, you uh, essentially start getting into their basic motivations, mm -hmm. as well as so introducing the, the conflict. conflict. Yeah, introducing the conflict. Then act two is the journey, essentially. This is when, okay, the conflict has been established, so let's see the characters yeah. try to resolve this conflict and see what obstacles and conflicts they encounter along the way in their path to resolving the central conflict. And Act 1 always ends with like a point of no return where you, you, now it's do or die. Mm -hmm. or and that's whatever, usually but, called yeah. the inciting incident. Inciting so, incident. So Act 1, uh, generally speaking, ends with an inciting incident that propels the conflict to the forefront and establishes the point, yeah, essentially the point of no return where the characters, okay, now the characters are set to go on this journey and they're locked into it. So act two would be the journey itself. Uh, you put obstacles in the characters' paths and watch them work their way through it on their way to achieving whatever their motivation is or whatever the resolution for the conflict is. And then the third, uh, the second act generally ends with some sort of... Uh, turning point or climax oftentimes or oftentimes the climax will be shortly after the end of the second act and then the third act is resolution the third act is okay you get your climax you get the resolution to the central conflict and then you have falling action and resolving uh any anything else that needs resolution for the remainder of the story so that's your basic intro to three-act structure. There's a little bit more to it than that, but essentially that's all you need to know. Uh, and so, question? Hold on, we can't hear you, Troy. Oh, uh, Okay, I was just going to point something out. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I was just going to, given your uh, summary of the three-act structure, I was going to uh, summarize die hard within that oh yeah yeah so yeah. that's what we're about to get into this is a good well, then, well, by all means yeah. go ahead no, oh, well let's see let's see can we can we identify the axe here i want to find out if the students can <laughs> yeah. given yeah, what enough. information uh i've i've established so oh, troy yeah. rose well i think the first act's probably pretty obvious yes. yeah because we already drew attention to that as rose was pointing mm -hmm. out so there's a there's then the, to end the first act is the inciting incident so you know what 
I I think I already have the general structure in mind, so I'm going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit us with it. Hit us. You're just saying that. You're <laughs> <laughs> handing it out like, I got it. Well, let's see. Let's off. see. What do you got? What do you got? Rose, give us that. Uh, oh. So which... So what is the inciting incident that ends the first act in Die Hard? I'm thinking... As you established, you, I think you have a pretty solid idea of what part of the film is the first act, right? And we already, you already commented a bit on that, how it's like, oh, you know, there's a certain duration of the film for which you're really not sure what the central conflict's going to be. And then something happens. Something happens. Classic writing term. Something happens. Yeah. What, that's my favorite. I, I always yeah. just say, like, and then something happens. And then, because yeah, something happens. What, that's, that's what the inciting incident is. Something happens. What is the exactly. something? The something that tells you immediately it, what the issue is <laughs> is it as simple as the terrorists pulling up or is it more specific no yeah that's pretty much it yeah that's basically it. Oh, yeah so, okay well it, I, I would say i would say the moment the first shots are fired is the inciting say, a lot incident. of yeah. films the inciting yeah. incident is very often as simple as a gun goes off and that's like that's the moment of like oh uh you know Panic happens, and it's like as soon as that first shot is fired, typically that's in an action film when act one's done, guns are starting to go off now. Now we're into the weeds of the action. Exactly. But that's a very good observation, though, because, like, essentially the moment the terrorists arrive, terrorists <laughs> arrive, they're essentially a heist crew. Um, yep. The moment they arrive makes the first that shot is. inevitable, right? Yeah. So it, it becomes a matter of when. And that as soon as that happens, first act ends because they're because they're still introduced in the first act and we don't know what's going on yet we don't know what the motive yeah you see are. them cutting wires they're yeah. doing all sorts of weird setup stuff that you're that's a little ambiguous yeah. at first and I, again Nothing i love those little yet. i love those little mini stories like when he's cutting the, yeah. the two brothers and one of them's cutting yeah. the wires with the chainsaw and the other one's like nine nine nine, nine, nine. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to do finish up whatever his work is before it's too late mm -hmm. and he's just like clearly and he's just Friggin' sweating bullets and it's like clearly he's about to ruin whatever the guy's trying to do it's like th that little there's a little bit of tension there and it's just this little mini story in the middle of all that setup that mm. is just there there's just so much to the writing but yeah it is as simple as uh, the bad guys show up and take over mm. um it's yeah yeah uh, you don't have to overthink it too much because the, lot, I guess, so here's here's the thing um we talk about this as if it, it requires and it, like a, an intense amount of like insight but really it's 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 a lot more simple in terms of like what's literally happening than we might make it seem it like the the uh the the great insight is in just knowing it exists exactly but once you know it exists the the things that uh construct these uh acts that are actually fairly simple when you start to think about it it's like okay uh something happens a gun goes off it's as simple as that now the story happens and then the rest of the movie follows mm -hmm. and of course we know the journey is just john getting uh absolutely getting his butt kicked destroyed <laughs> <laughs> and uh I, I want i think we were um we want we, we want to talk about this as well uh but just the amazing design of john's character yes. throughout the film because the entire second act can be described in uh john's attire Mm -hmm. Because as he goes on, which is this is just brilliant. Uh, it's not environmental storytelling. It's a character design storytelling. Yeah. Um, as he goes on, every single injury he accrues from from dispatching every single bad guy, you can look at and say he got that because he fought in like because it was this battle. He got shot here in this scene, and he lost you know that that piece of art that article of clothing because of this exact you know thing. And you can trace everything to something that he did as the, the second act keeps going forward and his shirt's getting dirty, he's mm -hmm. like acquiring scrapes and bruises and just gunk and grime. And, and that just continues to build up over the entire second act. And glass in his feet. Yep. Yeah, glass in his, ooh, glass in his feet. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's, and it, it's very intentional too because there's continuity yeah. to all of it. And when you consider how a film is constructed, that takes a lot of work to create continuity for all that because they're deliberately they're putting him in the in makeup order. chair. Films aren't shot in order. Exactly. He's, you're getting put in the makeup chair. You're getting your costume for the day. Every single time 
they're yeah they're consulting the script and looking okay what stage is john at in his progression at this point and i think they had like something like 17 different versions of his tank top for yeah. different points in the story and that is character design storytelling that's brilliant brilliant stuff from the art department that they yeah. tracked all that continuity in order to make sure that there's a progression to the way that john looks yeah Every injury, every scrape, it can all be traced, and you know exactly when he got it. Mm -hmm. I think he only ends up getting shot like once in this movie. He, yeah, he only gets he gets shot in the shoulder one time. Yeah, but uh, he gets injured a lot. Oh yeah, he gets pretty beat up, and that's what I yeah. love because, and I think that's what makes John McClane stand out so much as an action hero is he almost has a little bit of that same like Jackie Chan type spirit where he gets his butt kicked. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He's he's grittier than the other action heroes just by sheer fact that he's less powerful mm -hmm. right he's not this i mean he's competent to be sure but yeah. he's not this like bad navy seal dude who's just gonna uh he was just their worst nightmare and yeah. is gonna dispatch them all easily if they come across him they he establish right away yeah. right the very first person he kills he barely gets by right like he yeah. barely by the skin of his teeth manages to take out the first one and already you're right off the bat you're seeing like oh this is gonna be tough there are like 12 yeah, like, of that these was guys a crap. exactly that was a crap. <laughs> right you go to like commando right with arnold schwarzenegger and you see him just like mowing down uh, waves of bad guys uh and then you cut to john mcclain and you're just like oh these 12 guys are going to be a challenge right yeah. every single one of them is going to be an encounter of some kind mm -hmm. And which is also just amazing storytelling as well, um, where he's tracking everybody. But yes, it's they bring importance to each individual baddie. Yeah, every it's single not, one of them has a name. It's not like it's not the faction you're fighting. It's not like you're just like, oh, okay, we're fighting what the communists. I don't yeah, know. yeah, we got hordes of Nazis. Killing? Yeah, it's like who are we, who are we killing? I don't know. People in the red uniform. <laughs> yeah, it's like no, we, we have like Carl's gonna be a problem, and <laughs> Carl's a big problem. <laughs> Carl's a big problem, and we like we know each one of these people is going to be important because they have a name they have a story they have there's they have relationships implied, yeah there's implied relationships between all of them and we know each one of them is going to be difficult you can't just knock any one of these guys up because we're so invested in the bad guys except for a freaking some of them he dispatches more easily than others, obviously. Yeah. yeah. It is a, a freaking, I forget his name. The each moment. Fu Manchu. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he dispatches him pretty easily, which I think was a yeah. bit of a disappointment to a lot of action fans at the time, because he was actually, yeah, he's, he's a pretty uh, well-known, well, he's a stuntman primarily, but he's mm -hmm. like an actor stuntman uh, and martial artist that doesn't yeah. really get much of a highlight moment in this film, except for when he steals the candy bar. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I, I, this is a bit, is a bit sad that he just gets, he just gets blasted yeah. coming through a door. <laughs> yeah. But everyone's got a moment though. But everybody's got a moment. Well, because every time he takes one of out, but takes one of them out by virtue of the fact that the characters are counting the bad guys. Every time he takes one of them out, it becomes a moment, right? Just by that yeah, virtue. And the, the scale starts tipping. Yeah, scales start tipping. One by one, they start falling. And it gives weight and importance to every single kill, which is a huge, huge turn from the standard of action movies, especially at that time. So let's continue with the structure. So act two. Rose, you, uh, have, you have successfully identified act one and the inciting incident at the very end of it. And so yeah. we know the body of Act Two. When does what uh, ends Act Two? At what point does Act Two become transitioning to uh, Act Three? Now this one I think uh, might be a bit less obvious with this. This one. might be well because like, this this one has a very short Act Three. Are very. I was gonna say Act when Two and Act Three are very obvious. What was that when Hans falls? That would probably that'd be pretty close. I would say that whole encounter that was, yeah. would be the transition point between Act Two and Three. Because like I said, that climax, that's the climactic yeah, moment. That's a... And that's generally, um, well, because here's the thing. The last like 30, 40 minutes of this film starts getting really fast. There's so many yeah. incidents back to back to back that it does get a little hard to track. However, yeah. I would say there is a kind of, because there's a common uh beat that you see right before the transition to the climax and subsequently act three which is um the darkest hour beat 
And you definitely have a clear darkest hour moment in this film, which is when he's taking a short rest <laughs> in <laughs> the bathroom, right? Yeah. And taking the uh, glass out of his feet. That's a clear yeah. darkest hour moment, right? Because he's, he, he's, he's just been beat. He's recovering. <laughs> he's uh, demoralized, clearly. Yeah. And he just needs to lick his wounds and figure out what he's going to do next. And he has this heart to heart with the police officer outside yeah, like the, the self discovery. Yeah. Self discovery. And it's kind of like, it becomes like a darkest hour for both of them. Cause then we get, yeah. Officer Powell's backstory and we get mm -hmm. like why he is in the place that he is. And they kind of share this moment, but it, it's a shared low moment for both of them. Uh, on, on the, on the opposite end with the darkest hour also comes a moment of triumph. For the villains, I mean, the FBI turned the power off, and yep. then they access the vault. Aww. Merry Christmas! <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And they got their, exactly. They got their bonds. Yeah, their stock, whatever. And for random collector's items in there too, like those statues yeah. and samurai <laughs> <It's> armor. <laughs> and, yeah. There's a painting in the background. <laughs> yeah, but all those bonds. Yeah, no. and that's that's like that's when the, the turn starts to happen mm -hmm. and yeah you're i think you're definitely right there is a bit of an inverse of that yeah the darkest in uh, uh such literal conflicts as action movies have where you have heroes and villains it is a moment of triumph for the villains and especially because hans gruber is so characterized like i said to a certain extent you want to see both of them succeed and so yeah that vault opening moment is kind of framed as a triumph in as far as the how the scene was shot because you're kind of sharing it with these characters whose journeys you have yeah. been following as well. And then immediately after that, you have the, the final confrontation. And that, yeah, that's definitely, I think, that whole scene is that, trans is that transition point between two and uh, three, when everything starts to get wrapped up. Um, you, mm. you, the villains dispatched. All, they have all their moments of... Which, um, great... Well... So this is a diehard tradition. I could say this. It doesn't really ruin anything for the rest of the diehard films if you yeah, want to watch them. You don't have to see all the other ones. <laughs> yeah, you really don't have to. Uh, they're really kind of optional. This is... I will tell you this, this right now. This is the best one. <laughs> Hands down. Well, yeah. it's, it's the best in the whole genre. <laughs> it, it, it is the best in the whole genre, which by that virtue means it has to be the best in its franchise. Uh, but yeah, I'll say, I'll say this right now. This is the best one. It doesn't get any better than this with the Die Hard movies, but a lot of them are worth watching, I would say. But it is a Die Hard tradition. Well, first off, obviously, Yippie ki -yay is a Die Hard tradition. Uh, that's, that's his one-liner, uh, and he says it in every film. But it is uh, specifically... It is a bit of a tradition of, like, the final kill on the big bad guy is always a huge moment. And always accompanied yeah. by that one-liner. So he's got to send them out in style every time. And I got to say, this is probably... I mean, like I said, because it's the best film, it's hands down one of the best uh, yippee ki -yay moments for the final kill. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's such a simple yet clever strategy that he uses to finally uh, end them. You know, or it's just yeah. duct tape. Good old Two duct bullets tape. left. Two, two, bad, two bad guys left. Two bullets Two bad guys. What's he gonna do? Mm. I think I remember something along the lines of like, um, was it for this film where uh, they were carefully tracking the ammunition and like everything that uh, th throughout the film, where they made sure that by the time they got to the end, like, oh, yeah, he would actually have only two bullets left. Yeah, I've heard I've heard that said uh, oftentimes. Um, however, I did a little bit of digging before this just to see if I could verify it. Is it a myth? I don't know. It might be because I couldn't find any yeah. source or verification anywhere. I, I hear that, but I yeah, have, I've, I've, I've definitely it. heard that as well. But I don't actually know if it's true. Yeah. Um, especially because I think I think some was it that there's that gun gun DB uh website. I think I I came across one of their oh, pages yeah. on this one for this film. I didn't look in too much detail, but I did look there to see if they did have that information. And from what I understand, there are moments where he does fire more rounds than the Breda has capacity for. So that yeah. probably my guess is it might not be true. But yeah. it's it's it it does feel like something they would do though for the density of writing yeah. that they had. But maybe not perfectly tracked. Yeah. Close enough, right? Close enough that 
by the time he gets to the final encounter, he's got to have two bullets left. And that's such a good suspense because it gets you. You get there and you're just, you're, you're flabbergasted, right? He's just like, oh, MP5, out. I mean, that's like the fifth MP5 he's gone through anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's lost so many of them. But Beretta, the, the trusty sidearm that he's had the whole film, that's the only weapon he brought to the party. Two rounds left. Two bad guys. How is he going to kill them? Mm -hmm. It's such great suspense because it just gets the audience thinking. It's like, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? How's he going to get out of this one? Has his luck run out? And then he's just, he's got to basically use Final his moment. social abilities to get in close and guarantee a clean shot on both of them. Yep. That nervous laughter, man. That oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the crazy <laughs> laugh. Also, like, also, just Hans saying Ipikaye. Yeah. <laughs> But, and that's what I, there's this great little moment, I think, in that where Holly sees him for the first time since the whole incident began. Yeah. And just the way she reacts to it is it just makes you realize, yeah, he's been through the ringer. Because his wife seeing him in that state is just like, whoa. Yeah, whoa. Like, I have, n I just am beginning to fully comprehend what you've been through tonight. Because yeah. he is visibly beat up and just wrecked. He's been shot. He's been... He's limping. Yeah, he's been shot. He's been cut up on it all over. Yeah, he's bruised. He's battered. He's been blown up several times. Been blown up several times. He's crashed through several windows. He's n not in good shape. I mean, it, utterly dirty and sweaty and just covered in yeah. muck. And he looks like complete garbage by the time he gets there. And you see her reaction and you just start to realize it's almost a, a dawning moment for the audience to see, to just clock mm -hmm. how, how bad he's had it this whole night. Yeah. And especially hey, how it's honey. framed too. Yeah. What was that? I said, Hey honey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Just walking like, Oh, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> had a rough day at work. <laughs> But especially with like with how it's framed with that that harsh backlight, yes. just like it's such an epic shot. Yeah, when and you it's like, see, that's like, and, and you you know whatever happens, this is it. This is it. Is it's now or never, do or die. This is the final moment. Yep. He's got two bad guys to dispatch. The limo guy can handle the nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and I love his pitiful, just like ah. <laughs> he gets punched. <laughs> so yeah, those are those are generally. I think I think he's the only uh, guy from the crew to survive. He probably just got arrested. He might have. No, there was one other because uh, when John McClane comes into the vault, he knocks somebody out with the butt of his gun, and you see the uh, he's carrying the um, the bonds, and the bonds spill all over the floor. Oh, he just right. he, we only yeah. see him knock that dude out. Yeah, so that guy's probably true. still alive too. Two dudes. <laughs> so yeah, two dudes survive. Oh, little well, shout outs to the lobby guy who was just on lobby duty for the first part of their plan. He actually yeah. survived to the very end. He was one of the last two yeah. that, that died. Besides Carl, who, you know, came back as a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dead yet. And then just from beyond the grave. Blown to pieces by, mm -hmm. uh, what's his name? Al. 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 And then Al oh. gets his redeeming redeem yes. moment. Yes. I love that. And it's another testament to just how many darn little stories are in this film. There's a whole subplot there for the the uh, al's story arc and he gets yeah. he gets an entire arc even just as he this little side need, supporting character he has no there's no, he doesn't need a resolution like like yeah. his story arc is just, they're in the background he's like i just bantering like, okay yeah but like that's that doesn't need any further uh resolution but then he gets that just that moment of redemption like, yes yes and yeah i know you're so happy for him he's got redemption and that's what makes it a christmas movie is that there's yes. there's redemption all over this film and there's it's about it's about love and it's about family bonds and it's about doing what you need yeah to keep the family together and it's just such a good christmas movie it works on every level because yeah. like fundamentally the story we talk a lot about story versus plot the plot is nakatomi plaza gets raided by a bunch of would-be terror or fake terrorists who actually just criminals just regular criminals who just want to get really rich uh, but like the story is the things that John has to do to get his marriage back together. Exactly. And, and the the things it just happens to be an entire squad of highly armed Germans. Hi yeah, <laughs> yeah. Highly armed, highly trained, well funded, 
all the odds are against them, essentially. And when yeah. you see how utterly outmatched the police are against them, you realize yeah. John's the only person that can do something about this yeah. by the sheer virtue of the fact that he is unexpected. That is the yeah. only advantage he has is that he did, he was not factored into their plan. The police yeah. overpowered instantly. They're prepared uh, for that. Yeah, they were they were, they were ready for the police. They're ready for the FBI. The FBI were a joke in their plan. Yeah, like they were. <laughs> it was but John McClane, he's not the best. He's not the most highly trained. He's not the most competent, you know, person that they're up against. But yep. he is unexpected. Yeah. I I, I think I remember hearing gears. Yep. I think I remember hearing somebody describing uh uh, die Hard is basically like it's just uh, the right place at the wrong time. Exactly, and it's, that's basically his. Well, they even they character. straight straight up say that in the later films. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they call uh, him the uh, wrong guy like, in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> that that might have been it, but like, yeah, it's like it's he, he just he just happens to be the perfect person to be there at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the, the but the it's story of this film. The story of this film is is what he has to do to get his family back together, which is brilliant because that's I want to tie it right back into Rose's comments about how, yeah, you're, you're going through the first act and it's so mundane. And you're like, wait, what's this film going to be about? Like, I don't quite get it yet. But what you don't know is that what you're being shown is what the film is really about. Right. Yeah. Because you what you're waiting for was external conflict. But what the first act shows you is what the film truly cares about, which is it is about the relationship, right? It is about a marriage, essentially. Yeah. It is it is a marriage story. It, yeah. Well, know, and, 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 eat your heart out, Noah Baumbach. <laughs> <laughs> it was also really interesting too, because like uh then you look at uh her role in the story, right? Like what was her her job? Her job was to keep a lot of people safe and you know kind of she became the spokesperson for the company after the um, CEO gets Murked. off. <laughs> but yeah, but like her job is uh, as the kind of in between between like, you know, the terrorists and the uh, hostages. She's the one navigating and negotiating, uh, trying to get the best for everybody involved. Right. And that's and like that is still. That's her job in the marriage is she's trying to do the best for her family. And she has to navigate this corporate world, which is, I guess, in this regard or in this instance is the terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> but she has, she's that in between, between uh, doing the best for her family and doing the best for the people that she loves and having to go to those extremes and like, you know, having to be the, the, the negotiator and doing what she has to while McLean's off in the background trying to keep everybody safe mm -hmm. and just doing what he has to like just going through just going through the ringer just to get back to where he was doing the man thing being the father yeah. <laughs> essentially and in that sense it really works as that kind of narrative right that kind of family driven narrative and they both do their jobs very well. Very well. Yeah, and that's what I love. Like I said, all the characters are super active, and Holly is no different. Because she does the best that she can with the scenario that she's in, and she's on it, right? Like, she 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 wins a lot in this film. Yeah. I, I love that that moment when she first uh, comes to Han. She's like, Who, who's the idiot who put you in charge? You did. <laughs> you killed my boss. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Like, perfect she knows what she's doing she knows what she's saying and by the end of that entire interaction hans is just like it will be done you yeah. know and whoops yeah because it's just she just knows the right things to say that's where her skills lie and then even when it comes down to, down to the final encounter she's still on point right she's right on cue as soon as john gives her the signal she just like forget yeah yeah just ducks and smacks Hans around a little bit. <laughs> just, eh. Yeah, it's just she was she was on point the whole film. I guess this is the idea. <laughs> like yeah. she didn't skip a beat. And John's just out there flying by the seat of his pants. Yeah. But here's make things work. here's an anecdote I heard actually is apparently one of the writers. There was a pair of writers. Uh, I don't remember which one, but one of them was I think having a little bit of difficulty breaking this film. Uh, mm. and you run into a lot of these kinds of troubles when you're writing, right? It's just like, okay, I get the plot. Maybe I get the, 
you have to kind of never, but yeah. Yeah, I'm having trouble connecting the story. Like, what is this film at its core about? And he had a huge breakthrough when he had basically a near-death experience. And oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and so because he got into this argument with his wife and then, you know, I think later that night he's driving down the road and this like refrigerator box falls out of a truck and crashes into his vehicle. And I think it turns out like the box was empty or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. And thankfully, you know, he, he wasn't seriously hurt and it was a very, very minor accident, but it gave him a scare and he was just like, he had a realization. That could have been it. Yeah, where that could have been it. And he said, I never would have gotten to tell my wife that I was sorry. Yeah. And then, and that's when he realizes, like, that's what this film is about. Is this yeah. is a film showing the lengths that a husband is willing, is a, trying to go through in order to tell his wife that he's sorry after an argument. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the core through line of the entire film is just him trying to say sorry after an argument that they have in the first act. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. And kind of going back into this story again. That's deep. Yeah, w- watching it this time around, I kind of had that in the back of my head now that I knew that anecdote. And I was like, yeah, that really is the core of the story. And you see that right in the first act, right? You Well, first off, you meet Holly before you meet John McClane, really. I think John McClane might appear on screen first, but you don't really get to know his character as soon. Yeah. Uh, he's a little, he's a little bit quieter, but Holly, you meet her and you see her in action way sooner. And then, yeah, you, and then you get to know him a bit better. You see his journey all the way up to this fancy place that she works at Nakatomi Plaza. You see them meet for the first time. The first thing that happens is they get into this big fight. And then they spend the rest of the film simmering on that being their last interaction. And that's, that's the story. So you get to the first act and you're wondering, how is this an action movie? Or, you know, what is this film about? But what the film is showing you, by virtue of this being the first things you see, is this is what the film is about. And we probably have a whole separate set of films maybe to look at and to talk more about story versus plot. Story versus plot is huge. But that is the story of the film, not the plot, right? Like you were saying earlier, Lauren. The whole, the external conflict, all the stuff with the action and the, the combat... That's all, that's all plot. But the story is, is the marriage, essentially. Yeah, that's all, yeah. All the, all the gunfights and all the explosions, that's all, that's details, minor details. Mere externalizations of yeah. a broken relationship and just external conflicts that are keeping them from coming back together in order yeah. to do what they need to do. And that's the imperative yeah. that drives the entire thing. And whether or not you notice that, you feel it. And that's how you connect with the characters. And that's mm. ultimately the reason why you want John to survive is because he's got unfinished business that he, yeah. you want him to see resolved. Yep, and it keeps, like, uh, every, like, every time it keeps coming back to Holly, and she, she doesn't know what's, ha- what's happening, but she's always like, you know, like, what's he up to? What is he doing? He survived. Thank God. And it's just like, if, if only it wasn't for these darn terrorists, he can get back together with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Ugh. <laughs> oh. So, whew, I think we hit all the major points. Any other little minor details, observations, things you liked? Well, I do have one comment. All right. Hmm. You know that moment when the villain was fallen out of the that slow-mo sequence there? Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's a great shot, that, that little great. slow-mo. That's yeah, the best that. That's the best slow-mo sequence I've seen. Pods down. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible! <laughs> Boo. But it makes love sense. It. It love makes it. Sense. Love it. <laughs> uh, it is. It honestly is a really great slow mo shot, though. Like, I'm honestly really shocked really that that was shot in '88. I was like, they must have really gone out of their way to get this slow mo shot, you know, because it's secure a high speed camera just for that shot and that fidelity, and it looks great. Like, it's obviously it has to be comped, but and yeah. you could if you look for it, you can't. You can't probably kind of see the seams of the comps. I was I was looking for a little bit, but you could like barely see that yeah. edge line. Like it's it's a really high quality shot. It's very sharp. It's very sharp. It's very sharp. And I, I still wonder to this day. I've never bothered to look it up, but I still wonder to this day how they do did that darn shot of him falling all the way down because the figure is clearly moving. Yeah. So it can't be a dummy shot. Us, 
So my guess is animatronic is having uh, a oh. dummy with uh, articulated limbs that are just doing this. You're right, because it's probably That's, a that is my guess. Yeah, so uh, it's it's either that or it was the late '80s. I actually, I think that's I think that's the only thing that you would say to do because they see, you see it the entire way. You don't actually see it impact, um, or you don't see Hans impact. It stops below the tree line. Um, but that's why I was thinking if they drop if they drop the stunt person, theoretically they can stop him below. They hit the before he hits the the ground. But like that's just a really 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 far way to go. Well, that's they, what they I was thinking. Way down. I was thinking if it if not animatronic, that's brilliant. That's probably what it is. But I was thinking as an alternative, where my mind went, and this again, this is the pure speculation part of it because there isn't a right answer to this whole conversation, and we're just, just <laughs> yeah, we're just we're just spitballing using our film brains. How would and, I do it? <laughs> yeah, try and figure out what I was thinking when I saw that shot again was, uh, yeah, I thought it was a stunt person wirefall because a yeah. as you pointed out. The they cut cut before you see him hit the ground, or rather, he, the, the fall is hidden, right? You can't see any yeah. impact. So I was like, okay, why would they want to hide the impact? Probably because it's a real person and he can't actually impact. And, and, and there's a massive airbed below. Yeah, or either a massive airbed, or they could have stopped him. Either way, he's being stopped. It's not it's not a a serious crash. But the reason why I thought it was. The idea occurred to me that it might be a stuntman doing just a really long wire fall is because, A, you know, there's like kind of darkness off in the background. It'd be a really easy shot to hide a wire in Very because, easy. right, we can't paint out wires yet at this point. It's 88, um, at least not easily. And not easily. Uh, so it, it, was a, it was a perfect shot to hide a wire in. And it also didn't look like it was falling at you know terminal velocity it essentially well, I'll, I'll, yeah I'll it was a little say, too even like it looked like a bit of an unnatural pace for a fall and so i think it was a controlled a controlled fall one of the ways they might have been able to do it is shoot it in um shoot it at an alternate frame rate where they speed it up after so he's oh, falling true. slower than um it shows in the final cut but then they speed up the footage after as with alternate frame rate where he's that looks like he's falling at uh a terminal at the speed he should be but the physics don't work out the same way. Yeah, kind of, because it, it does. It looks a little bit off. But yeah, there is something I, that looks off about it. Dropped. I still think, or I still, I still think it's a dummy that is dropped with articulating limbs, and they literally just drop like. And the reason it lo it looks unnatural dummy. is because <laughs> it's just not as heavy as a real person, probably. Maybe, is what yeah. it, in that case. Although no, I don't think it's a dummy. I think it might be a stunt person, because if it were a dummy, it would fall a lot more uncontrolled. I think that's the that is the yeah the, that's the true main key is that it is because, a very controlled ball it and, doesn't flip over and it tracks perfectly yeah right like well I don't know maybe that might have been a production miracle production miracles do happen <laughs> it does but, happen <laughs> uh, they, these things do happen but that track is perfect like they keep them yeah. in frame perfectly the whole way down shout outs to that camera operator <laughs> yeah. But if it's a very controlled fault, actually, that might be a lot easier than we suspect. But yeah. I'll have to look into it at some it, point. And also because it is off the side of a building, just stick a crane up there. And yeah. Then... Um, but it would be a very long wire uh, fall. <laughs> no. I, that would be yeah. hands down one of the longest wire falls I've ever seen. But yeah, can you imagine being the same person signing out for that? It's like, all right, you're going to do a wire fall. It's like, cool, sweet. Uh, 30 stories up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. They don't do the whole the whole fall. Because he's already falling by the time that shot starts. Yeah. So also, Nakatomi Plaza is a real building. It's worth noting. Um, so does anybody else know what building that is? I looked it up at one point, but I don't uh, know. Right now. Nakatomi, the building that plays Nakatomi Plaza is the Fox headquarters in L.A. Uh. So... The studio, they, they produced the film. So the studio literally just rented out their own space to shoot this film in. So it's yeah. an actual, and that's the thing, it was still under construction partially at that time. So what you're seeing is genuine under construction set. But so that's we, part of why I think it looks so natural, you know, because there's a yeah. lot of that film that's just like, man, this is a really good set because it's just an actual building. building. Yeah. And I love I love the environmental storytelling as well, right? I was talking about to Lauren at the end when it gets to the point where he's on his way to the final confrontation, the, but the big explosion has just gone off on the roof, and every, he went that series of shots, 
not even any dialogue. They're not really scenes, but just connecting tissue shots of John McClane making his way through the main lobby area where we see most of the host- hostages for a lot of the time. Making his way through yeah. that area with like the rubble falling and pieces of debris and everything's on fire. And it's just it's such an epic looking part of the film. And it's at that point that for me, it, it kind of sinks in of just how intense and epic the situation is. And he's just mm-hmm. sitting there all beat up, torn to shreds, limping his way across this this room, just like, ah, where's my wife? Where's the bad guys? What are they up to? With his, you know, last weapons, and his, you at that point that sinks into me how much of a journey this character has been on, on his l- last walk to the final confrontation. Yeah. Oh, another thing, I guess on my end, I guess since we're doing last little observations and notes, fun little things to draw attention to. One thing I really like in this film, and this part of its overall cleverness, is just its use of guns for things other than shooting yes i always think that's real or rather other than other than just like pure violence like guns as utility i think yeah is that's one of those things on the m5 or whatever that weapon is where he has to rappel down yeah you know the the strap yeah the strap in that classic air duct sequence oh gosh like i I saw like uh rose is freaking out the whole time it's like i hate this (laughs) like as he starts to rappel down it's like it's it's, it's so intense. So... It's it's the the suspense is real. Yeah, I know, Rose, like, you're cringing. There's this much firearm on both ends of the duck, just <laughs> yeah. holding him in place. There's just that much. It's just like, oh, oh yeah. Doesn't that just give you anxiety, Rose? Oh. And then the strap starts to slip. Yeah, just slowly. You see it slowly uncurl. Uh, just come to the party, have a few laughs. <laughs> will be fun, they said. <laughs> Which, if you didn't know, Rose, that is a classic shot, the one where he lights up the lighter in the mm-hmm. air duct. Oh, yeah, so even I recognize that one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that is an absolutely classic shot. And it's a brilliant shot. Like, it's so full yeah. of character. It's this extreme close quarters close-up. It's and just remember... the look on his face as he lights up this... Uh, oh. Also, huge attention to detail, his inventory, right? As it changes yeah. throughout the film, you see where every single thing he has, he, you know where it came from. That lighter, you see him pick it up on the first duffel bag. It's first just like, thing. yeah, he's all he's well, it, he, looking he, a little well, he beat gets, up. He's in his tank top. He gets, he gets this cigarette. lighter that he's stole. He gets the cigarette and lighter from the first guy. Exactly. The cigarettes and yeah. the lighter. That The cigarettes last a while. He gives the last one to Hans Gruber. Yep. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, he's just in there, all beat up, crawling through a vent with a stolen lighter. With yeah, as his I only remember, source of sight, and he's just like, "This sucks." <laughs> I remember. Uh, I think I was watching some behind the scenes a long time ago of the art department trying to find, um, like, basically the right ducts for that scene because they knew they had to do the scene. But they're like, "Okay, we need to find the right ducts," and it, and it turns out uh, ducts the size of a person don't exist. <laughs> um, so like, they had to find like these giant HVAC, uh, basically uh vents that for him to climb through and they're like they had to find this very specific kind of uh ventilation system that they, that they ended up using in the final shot because it ducks aren't that big in real life like you yeah. can't call through uh, uh yeah ducks aren't that big but they had to find these specific like hvac vents that he could crawl through and then they they just took like a section of like a corner and then just shot that in the in the studio they had to light up and then timed it for when he turned his his lighter on they like uh shone on him and had the reflections mm. but they're like yeah like they had apparently they had a lot of trouble finding that exact uh piece of uh hardware for that shot wow. and making it look uh <laughs> making it look real for him to climb through and it's a great cutaway too the reverse shot yeah. on that like it's weird because at least it strikes me as so weird because from a film standpoint like a pure cinematic standpoint it almost feels like it shouldn't work right it's like what beat is happening there because you just it's a reverse shot but the reverse shot doesn't really tell us any more information it's just more ducked down the other way but somehow it's so effective on an emotional level right you cut from that frame of just you know john mcclain being uh annoyed and then you cut (laughs) to that reverse shot and for some reason, it hits so well. You know what I mean? It, it shouldn't work, but it does. And I think it, it's just all Bruce Willis's performance that makes yeah. it work, right? From that face to that reverse shot, 
it hits so hard. You're just like, yeah, what a stinking situation. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's so Christmas. in the weirdest way. It's like, yeah, I, I feel you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you cut, cut the there, way to that. I've been, there, I've been there before. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like you haven't, but you get it, right? Like it, yeah, it works yeah. on an emotional level. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of that, though, if you look for it, of guns as utility that I really like, right? Because not only just, yeah, that's the most obvious example, using the MP5 gun strap yep. to repel down a vent. But, you know, even just before that, right, you see him shoot out the locks with that same gun on a door yeah. in order to uh, get through it. Um, and then even, I think, even between that and getting to the vent, he uses it to jam uh, a fan that he has to get through. That's right? right. Yeah. Just yeah, like yeah. all sorts of utility that and, really grounds and, you in the world of and establishes that these characters are thinking clever characters. Hans and uh, Carl shooting out the glass, right? Yes. It's like, Don't shoot him, shoot the glass. It's like, yeah, we can't get a clear shot on him, but we could hurt him. We could injure him. We yeah. could slow him down, yeah. do something besides direct violence with the weapons. And that's what makes this film really stand out as an action movie for me is it establishes the power and usefulness of firearms in a way that they are actually powerful and useful in real life and uses them for something completely uh, different than direct violence. Yeah. And that's well, super I cool. You don't, don't see that a lot in action films. Firearms. Like uh, I, I talk a lot about uh, a, a lot about this when just like, if you hear me talk about uh, my theories of violence, combat and uh, all that other stuff, but like, the person's the weapon, the firearm is the tool. And it's just a tool, especially if you start to look at like how, you know, people who use firearms as a job, how they consider uh, their firearms, like it's just a tool to establish or to uh, complete a goal. And different firearms obviously have different kind of utility purposes, like shotguns are very heavily utility, like the point man in like you play a lot of video games, right? Like the point man's got this big shotgun uh, in a thing. It's like, well, why does the point man have a shotgun? Because that it's not because he's the one going in and he's the most heavy firepower. A shotgun is to open doors. It's to blow out locks. It's to blow out, it's, it's to open doors. It's a key. That's why he has a shotgun. And that's why everyone behind him has rifles. He's got the shotgun because that's a utility item. That's how people who actually use firearms think of firearms as a tool, not as the thing that I'm going to kill the enemy with. And it's the only thing that I have. It's not just a... Yeah, it's not just a weapon. <laughs> it's not it's... just a weapon. Like, the person who's using it is the one who's using a tool intelligently. And that's what makes them the weapons. Mm -hmm. Like, we're, we're, I need to use this tool to hurt the enemy. I can't hit them with the tool, but I can use it to change their environment. Yeah. And even, shoot the glass. even from the very outset, right? And this is something, right? There's another way that firearms are really used uh, is... You know, especially by criminals or even soldiers, you know, in yeah. certain environments is crowd it's control. A, it's a force multiplier. Yeah. yeah, it's a force multiplier and it's a threat, right? So crowd control, it's super useful for. And you see that with the crew that rolls in, you know, to take yep. the hostages, just make a huge ruckus, shoot the air a bunch yep. and corral everybody to where they need to be. You want to get everybody's attention? You could shout or you can fire off some rounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's purely... A mode of communication it's intimidation it's fear factor and there, there, there's all sorts of psychology that you see all the characters implementing throughout the film too that i think is really clever right because they're constantly the human element is never forgotten in this film yeah right and john mcclain uses it and hans gruber use it they both everybody play people like socially intelligent people mm -hmm. and because that's the thing right the whole climactic sequence where he finally confronts han right john mcclain has only has his social prowess to be able to get close enough. And how does he talk his way up to them, right? He comes in with an MP5 that is completely empty, bear in mind. That gun's completely empty, but it's enough to get him in the door, essentially, as yeah. a matter, in a, in a, uh, in a matter of speaking. So he, he, he walks in disarmed, literally, like he's actually, he doesn't have uh, a threat in his hands, but they don't know that. So yeah. when they when they convince him to drop his weapons, they believe at that point he is then disarmed mm -hmm. because it's the social aspect of I am dropping the thing that is the tool that is a weapon, even though it's completely empty. Even though it was a bluff the whole time, mm -hmm. and the actual his actual weapon is 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 hidden. Yeah, but he's got no shirt, so you he's can't got, tell. He's like, got no shirt. No, there's no. He, I don't see any firearm like on him. It looks like he's bared. He's you know coming in literally vulnerable and metaphorically vulnerable. Mm hmm. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. 
Okay, any other last notes, observations, things we liked? I like the whole movie. I know. It's, <laughs> there's so many. We could t sit here all night with good observations of great little bits of storytelling or just good stuff from the film. All right. All right. If there's nothing else then from anybody. I think, I think that'll be... I think we I can mean, go ahead can, and wind it down. We can continue to talk about this ad nauseum. I know. Every film we've done so far, <laughs> every film that we've done so far are films that we could stay up all night talking about and still not exhaust everything that there is to talk about, which yep. sucks because these are videos that have to end at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem because like as soon as these the, the video and the recording ends, we just keep talking about it. That's <laughs> the thing. We talk oh, about true. it. We talk about it when we cut. We talk about it the day after. <laughs> We talk about it years later. Yeah. <laughs> We're still talking about Die Hard. I first saw this movie when I was very young. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, but we should have to close. Nonetheless, okay. yeah, gotta we gotta we so, gotta cut things here. So, at least I got to talk about three act structure. I think that's a uh, a specific lesson to take away from this film yeah. that I can point to as an object uh, object lesson. So yeah, and, and as an artist, uh, the design of McLean's character, his character design, and how yes. that tells story, that is uh, yes. just absolutely brilliant from an, just from our, the art department's um, mm -hmm. side of things. And again, I think that's a testament to the collaboration of film, right? Film is yeah. such an inherently collaborative medium, and films that are this brilliant are never one person's fault. <laughs> 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 Essentially, you know, no one person is responsible for making a film this brilliant. It's the symphony of everybody in the crew and the cast working together to create something artistically focused with a myriad of different features and aspects all working in tandem to create something something brilliant and yeah the art department doing stuff like that of you know i don't know maybe that was something that the director requested as well i don't know what order the idea took but it's such a brilliant piece of the story the yeah. way like John McClane's shirt is a trope, right? Like that yeah. when someone says John McClane's shirt, you know, you know what they mean, because a story is being told just by the character's appearance throughout the whole film. Everything, everything is a little story in this movie, and again, it's so rewarding for multiple rewatches, and just rewatching it again year after year, I'm still being rewarded by how much sheer detail there is in this movie, and plus, it's just such. A superficially entertaining and thrilling adventure and mm -hmm. yeah it's a it's as a storyteller it's so inspiring as a writer it's something to aspire to it's a feat in my opinion and honestly if you're going to be a storyteller this is i can guarantee you now a film you'll be referencing for a long time because a lot of yeah. people who teach storytelling still do reference this film a lot there's just so much to draw from it but that being said, Merry Christmas. This Merry will be our Christmas, last everybody. P Cubed Film School for the year. This will be our last video in the year. <laughs> Probably our last video of the year. I guess we'll see you all in 2022 then, in which oh, oh, yeah. is going to be a lot of exciting things in 2022. 2021 may have been a bit bare, but rest assured, we've got a lot of stuff in the works. But for now, P Cubed Film School will keep the channel occupied. But like I said, yeah. there's a lot in the so, pipeline right now, a lot of which was basically worked on throughout the entirety of 2021. So yeah, hopefully we'll yeah. see some some of those payoffs next lot, year. Yeah, we're gonna start to see a lot more of the um, uh, things that we can show. Yeah, uh, coming the fruits of our labors. So that being said, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New what Year. What have you? We'll be back in 2022 with probably some more films to look at. I'm really not sure what we're doing next. We shall consult the list. <laughs> yes. So the ever expanding list, ever expanding list. It's getting a longer, a lot faster than it's getting shorter. But that's the, that's the, that's the problem is we're never going to get through that list ever. Which we're going to, we're going to knock off a film and we're going to add to, then we're going to knock off a film and we're going to add to, <laughs> which makes it great content. This, yeah. this series can run indefinitely. <laughs> as long as, our movies, okay. as, long as there are them. good movies. <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, you can always uh, watch <laughs> the rumor. <laughs> that is, fair point. <laughs> we should do that. 
one of these Aprils. Oh, no. We should just watch, watch, watch The Room for PQ Film watch, School. Watch The Room. Watch Birdemic. <laughs> watch the trailer yeah, for Birdemic. Birdemic. <laughs> you yeah. don't need to watch Birdemic. Uh, but there are definitely things to be learned. <laughs> yeah. How not to make a yeah, film. Yeah, we could just say it. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, we'll see you in 2022. Mm-hmm. Thank you all very much for watching. Till next time, peace. Squared. Have a good night. God bless. Good night and sweet dreams. All of the good things. Merry Christmas. God bless. Have a good night. Good night.